Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for a 2020 Climate Action Update. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policies to policymakers. We've also, over time, developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. This is our final briefing of the year. Whether in person or online, we have been proud to welcome several thousand attendees, including congressional staff, federal agency representatives, advocates, stakeholders, business leaders, and concerned citizens to our briefings. We've covered a lot of issues as diverse and divergent as coastal resilience finance in Hawaii, to energy efficiency programs offered by rural electric cooperatives, to climate impact on cultural heritage sites, to K through 12 aquaculture classes. Thanks to everyone who participated in our congressional education programming this year, and especially to our amazing panelists. And we're working on a fantastic briefing slate for 2021, if I might set aside my modesty for just a second. With a new Congress and administration, EESI will be ready to do our part to ensure that policymakers have the information, analyses, case studies, and success stories necessary to motivate them to take action on climate change. Whether briefings or fact sheets, everything we produce is freely available and accessible online. And as always, the best way to stay up to date and never miss a thing is to visit our website at www.eesi.org and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. As eager as I am to get started after the holiday break and hit the ground running in 2021, Today, our topic is the status of climate action goals as, the end, as of the end of the current year, 2020. I guess the first two months of 2020 were okay, but for the most part, this has been a difficult and challenging year. It has also been a critical time in the fight against climate change. From here, we embark on the coming decade with 2030 goals looming and the need to reduce emissions and transition justly and equitably to a decarbonized clean energy economy is only becoming more and more urgent. In the years since the adoption of the Paris Agreement, the story of climate policy in the US has been a tale of two extremes. On the one hand, the executive branch has abandoned our international commitments, ignored science, and done its best to undermine efforts. On the other hand, not to be deterred, states and local governments have done their best to fill the leadership vacuum, set goals, and implement policies and programs needed to reduce emissions. A key driver of our efforts at ESI has been the work picking up in intensity in some corners of Congress, that has amplified the progress of states and local governments. Probably the most notable example of this is the report issued over the summer by the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. And so now after the past few years, where do we find ourselves? That is the topic of the briefing today. What have we achieved? What do we need to do now? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And to help answer these questions, we will first hear a presentation of two major reports. We are still in to deliver America's pledge, a retrospective, and delivering on America's pledge, achieving climate progress in 2020. And then we'll be joined by a panel of experts for a moderated discussion to reflect on this progress and consider what might come next. Before I introduce our panelists, let me mention two important bits of logistics. First, if you miss anything or want to learn more, you can access an archived webcast as well as written materials and the slides from our panelists if you visit us online at www.esi.org. And second, after the presentation of the two reports, when we get to the discussion, we'd be glad to incorporate your questions too. And if you have a question, you have two options to ask it. First, you can send us a message on Twitter, following us at EESI online. Or second, you can send an email to EESI at EESI.org. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions during our Q&A discussion. The presentation I mentioned will be jointly delivered by Nate Holtman and Carla Frisch. Dr. Nate Holtman is Director of the Center for Global Sustainability and Associate Professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. He is also Associate Director of the Joint Global Climate, excuse me, Glo Joint Global Change Research Institute. I wanted to put climate in there so bad. Uh, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And Carla Frisch is a senior principal at Rocky Mountain Institute working on America's Pledge. America's Pledge brings together private and public sector leaders to ensure the United States remains a global leader in reducing emissions and delivers the country's ambitious climate, ambitious climate goals of the Paris Agreement. Nate and Carla, thank you so much for joining us today. I can't wait to hear your presentation. 
and I'm sure it will trigger a really, really interesting discussion afterwards. So welcome to the briefing today. Well, thank you, and, and thanks to EESI for, for pulling this together, uh, and also for the, uh, our fellow panelists uh, for, for uh, lending their, their thoughts and, and uh, perspectives to this conversation today, uh, as well as to all of you for joining and, uh, and for your interest in, and support of uh, this interesting and, and uh, critically important topic. Um, let's see, so I just want to be sure, can we go to the, the introductory slide? Great. So, um, so, so my name is Nate Holtman. I, I'm, I've been uh, co-leading this uh, project called America's Pledge with uh, my colleague Carla Frisch, who you'll hear from in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, one of the, the dimensions that America's Pledge has been tackling over the past few years is actually to better understand climate action in the United States, as, as we heard in the introduction, uh, during a time when uh, the federal government, is particularly from the executive, has been uh, has been largely absent or uh, uh, changing policies in a way that that uh, contravened uh, climate action. So what we've what we've seen and what we've witnessed over the past few years is a tremendous groundswell of activity from the bottom up, from state, cities, and businesses, uh, and many other actors. We'll hear more about them also during the discussion. Um, who have stepped up to say we are still in uh, for the goals of the Paris Agreement, as well as to climate action in the United States. And so America's Pledge has been put, pulled together and works with uh, a number of other partners, I'll mention in just a few minutes, um, to better understand what that action is, uh, what impact it's been having, what impact it could have, and also how that there might be partnership with a re-engaged federal government. And we'll, we'll talk through some of those uh, some of those various issues uh, during the course of this short presentation. Next slide, please. So America's Pledge and We Are Still In work uh, closely together. Uh, we Are Still In is a large uh, uh, organization of, of actors of uh, various kinds who have stepped up to, to, to say we are still into the goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and we've got uh, Ilan, uh, uh, we'll hear from later today, who's been helping organize that. Um, and, and America's Pledge is, is, a, is an organization that's been working across different uh, research institutes, including my own, but also Rocky Mountain Institute and World Resources Institute as co-equal partners, um, as well as working with Bloomberg Philanthropies as a partner uh, to, better, uh, to, to, to better understand the, the impacts of all these, these actors stepping up. Next slide, please. Great, and I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but I just wanted to note that there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of analysis that we've done uh, on this question, and we're gonna give you a flavor of that today, but uh, obviously you're welcome to go to the website, uh, look, look in more detail. There's not only kind of summaries, but also for those of you who are interested, a lot of uh, technical documentation, uh, particularly laying out different kinds of policy platforms and opportunities as we understood them through the course of the last few years of work uh, with this great team uh, that I've been working with. So next slide, please. Okay, and so just to just to kind of sketch out, sort of to, to orient us in terms of how uh, we in America's Pledge with We Are Still In, but also I think the more broad climate community, including the subnationals in the US, have evolved our thinking in some ways over the past couple of years. Um, I think it's, 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 you know, obvious that if we're dealing with climate change, that this is a you know, this is an international issue. There's a global dimension of climate change. We all know that there's uh, a need for all to control and uh, act in, in different ways in their different country contexts. Um, and so, so the international discussion around climate change has always been a focus of attention uh, for, for countries around the world, as well as for people interested in climate action. Uh, globally. Um, the, uh, another dimension that's also been, uh, you know, very uh, clear and obvious to most people throughout the last few decades of climate is that national action matters. Um, you know, we've, we've been focused on thinking about what kinds of climate policies might the U.S. enact, might Europe, might China, might all of the other key emitters enact. Um, those are going to be always critical because a lot of the, you know, primary policy levers uh, always reside with the, with the national level of government. Um, but in addition, one thing we have learned over the past couple of years is the critical importance of not just the international, not just the national, but the subnational community 
in driving forward an ambitious climate agenda, not only at the national level, but frankly, also at the international level. And what we found and what we have discovered through the actions and leadership of a number of organizations and uh, governors and city mayors throughout this country and even globally, is that these actions not only uh, deliver emissions reductions when aggregated at a meaningful scale, but also create the conditions for a stepped up federal re-engagement that can actually then do more and do it more robustly over time than if we had not had this subnational action to begin with. And so it's a critical piece to recognize that those three elements interlinked is how we can build a more robust, a more ambitious, and a more frankly implementable uh, national climate strategy. And the work that we've been doing with uh, subnational partners as well as with America's Pledge has been trying to elucidate exactly the mechanisms for how that works and how much those kinds of uh, joint actions can really do in terms of an overall U.S. emissions trajectory, uh, which we'll see a little bit of in the next slide. Um, so uh, what we what we have um, you know seen and witnessed, like I said, in the past few years, is a tremendous groundswell of subnational actors stepping up. Um, what we see in this particular slide is, is, a, is a kind of numerical representation of what the size of those coalitions uh, looks like. Uh, you can see that, for example, there's roughly you know, half of our states uh, and a number of cities, a number of uh, businesses uh, and other actors numbering at this point nearly 4,000 independent actors across these different constituency types um, have stepped up and are doing different kinds of climate actions within their own jurisdictions. The map on the right is one way to look at that, which is, again, it's sort of primarily looking at the numbers of actors who have signed up and what they're, where they actually are geographically. Um, now, that is, frankly, amazing, and it's, it's quite impressive, and, and there's a lot of uh, genuine energy and activity from that community. A key question, though, remains, which is what do they actually add up to? All of these different commitments, we welcome them. They are incredibly important in and of themselves but can they make a difference in the overall pathway of the US emission story? And that's another element of our analysis, which we can show you on the next slide. Um, a next way to think about it is not just the numbers, but what is the scale of that, that set of actors? And this was something we uh, did take a look at in some detail. Um, shortly stated, those actors already, and in fact, this is always growing, but they already represent over half of US emissions. They represent 65% of the U.S. population and nearly 70% of U.S. GDP. Just to put that in context, that GDP number, if, if that coalition were an actual country, um, it would represent an economy uh, that was roughly the size of China's uh, and the world's second largest economy. So this actor group, the scale of it is actually quite large. And that's uh, important and also kind of gives us more confidence to think that this, you know, this group can actually make a difference. But of course, the final step is what are the policies they're enacting and how much can those policies actually make a difference? And to answer that part of the story, we'll look at the, the next slide. And this shows what the actual outcome is of the, the various commitments, even as of uh, roughly last year, this report came out about six months ago. Uh, actually, no, a little bit longer. I guess it's about a year ago. Sorry, <laughs> time flies in COVID times. Um, about a year ago, we, we came out with this report. Um, and what this shows is that those actors working together uh, already committed to something like uh, reductions that add up to something like 25% reductions relative to 2005 levels by 20 uh, by 2030, uh, but expanded action by this set of states, cities, businesses, and others. The uh, continued leadership and consistent leadership we've seen over the past couple of years um, could get us to something like 37% uh, reduction by 2030. And um, with additional action from the federal government and additional re-engagement from the federal government, uh, we showed that that could uh, lead up to something like a 49% uh, reduction by 2030. Now, it's just important to note, since we now are on the cusp of a federal re-engagement, um, that our analysis did look at a very vigorous federal re-engagement, including from Congress. And so those numbers ought to be kind of interpreted in that light, uh, and uh, more can be to discuss about this if, if people are interested during Q&A. Um, so that's what we kind of discovered in some, some ways. We as a community discovered that over the course of the last few years, and America's Pledge kind of helped sort of understand what the, what the actual impact of those might be. Um, but really the leadership and the work has come from uh, the subnational community. And I think it's really important for us to pause and 
uh, both give credit to and reflect on the importance of that action over the past few years. And then also now, as we are on the cusp of thinking about a federal kind of strategy, um, to think about how we make that into an all-in national climate strategy that truly integrates this action and builds it into a longer term and more robust uh, national strategy. So um, that's kind of where that part of the analysis goes. One thing that we did want to also understand, um, and I think was a critical thing for this kind of immediate period of this year and the next couple of years, is how the kind of COVID situation uh, impacts overall emissions trajectories in the US, and frankly, to look at what we've done as a community over the past few years uh, and, and sort of aggregate and understand uh, some, some particular highlights from that. And to tell you more about that, I am very happy to hand over to uh, my colleague and co-lead for this project, Carla Frisch. Hi, very happy to be here with you all today and thanks to EESI. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the specifics that are happening on the ground across the country. So on the next slide, we have a couple examples for you. So since 2017, when this movement uh, became much more formalized and organized, of course, it, it's been going on for decades that we have states and cities and businesses and others leading on climate. But since 2017 and that formal organization in the U.S., the number of electric vehicles has doubled. 16 states have committed to HFC, hydrofluorocarbon phase down. Now, 16 states is enough that it almost becomes a de facto federal standard because you don't want to have two different products for, for two different sets of states. So amazing progress by states stepping up. And we've seen a real shift in public understanding and thinking about the energy transition. And polling shows that 79% of Americans support a renewable energy future in the United States. Now, that's not the 50-50 voting split that we see in some recent elections, local and national. That's, that's a huge majority really focused on the path to clean energy. On the next slide, a couple more. So as far as commitments to 100% clean energy, Back in 2017, it was just Hawaii leading the way and saying, we're legally committing to this. Now we've got 13 states and Puerto Rico and over 170 cities. And the really exciting part is that more than 30 cities have already achieved 100% clean energy. So we're seeing both the commitment and the follow through from these local leaders. Seven states and 27 gas companies have committed to methane leak reduction along the supply chain. And a new emerging trend over the last year or two years is this movement toward all electric buildings to really reduce indoor air pollution and reduce greenhouse gases. So now 6 million people in the US live in cities with a commitment to be all electric. Next slide. So. Yeah, as was mentioned at the top, there have been two good months of 2020 so far, January and February. So we wanted to look in depth and understanding the, the really tough times that have been going on for all of us and particularly tough for some, the global pandemic and the economic recession, you know, flanked by the need to address climate change and the urgent conversation that we're having about racial and economic justice. So for those, we wanted to dig in deeply and figure out what exactly is going on in the U.S. in 2020 under these circumstances. So on the next slide, we give you a little snapshot of the tracking that we've been doing. And uh, I'll say we have, we've had a good problem, which is that in our work in tracking climate and clean energy action, we just can't track it all. There is so much happening. So this timeline has some of the key um, key amazing accomplishments over the past year. And you can find it in our report where you can scroll in on the font and get it to a size that works for you. But a couple of my favorites here include Houston and Kansas City committing to net zero, 100% clean, right when they were in the heart of the pandemic and figuring out how to house people in hospitals. And part of that is the deep connection that these local leaders are seeing 
between addressing climate change, lowering costs in their communities by moving to clean energy, and providing sustainable economy and, and health benefits for their residents. So these solutions are really intertwined. Now on the next slide, I'll give you a snapshot of our analytic work. So we dug in really deeply into five sectors to figure out what's going on on the ground. So we looked at what are the key drivers affecting emissions, what's the direction and extent of recent trends, and what's their potential to affect emissions reductions in 2030. So I won't go through all the details on the right, but on the next slide, I'll give you the key conclusion, which is this. Overall, our assessment modestly increases our confidence in the ability of states, cities, and businesses, and others to deliver on bottom-up climate action. So this result, I would say, was counterintuitive to us in starting the research project. We thought 2020 might have slowed down this action. But in fact, the trend in the US has sped up in some cases. Uh, a really huge amount of progress here. And on the next slide, I, I think one of the factors for that trend is that about 70% of Americans support this move to 100% clean economy by 2050, to prioritizing the clean energy and to protecting communities of color from climate impacts and stronger fuel efficiency standards. So this is the direction that people wanna go and they have not let COVID and an economic recession slow them down. So on the next slide, Another key part of our analysis was looking at what's possible for, for clean stimulus and recovery. You know, this is an active conversation on the Hill now, and we imagine will continue into the spring. You know, perhaps there's different tranches that are possible. But there's a lot that can happen in communities around the U.S. that supports action on climate but also improved air quality and improved local economies. So in electricity, that could include investments in grid modernization. In transportation, keeping public transit up and going and providing workforce training for a shift to electric vehicles. In methane, uh, helping, helping clean up idle and abandoned infrastructure. In buildings, expanding our weatherization and efficiency, uh, expanding this trend toward electrification and in HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. There's huge opportunities here on shifting to HVAC and optimizing our end of life disposal. So on the next slide, we have the, the link to the two reports here if this piqued your interest and you'd like to go deeper. There's a lot of material there about the amazing things that have happened in the last four years. And in particular, the deep dive on 2020 where things have sped up instead of slowed down. And we're really looking forward to the, the possibility of an all-in focus on climate, where these states and cities and businesses and others have the opportunity to partner with federal leaders to continue some of this movement. So thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Carla, and thanks, Nate. <clears throat> uh, congratulations on uh, all the work that went into that. Um, I know it was a, a lot of efforts on, a, on the parts of a lot of people and. Uh, it's it's really really important um, for people to um, realize that in the United States, climate policy isn't just federal policy. Um, it's also state policy, local policy. It all adds up. Um, so thank you very much. A quick reminder: if you missed any of that, if you want to go back and look at some of the slides in more detail, they'll be made available um, on ESI's website, www.esi.org. And if you missed any of it, uh, there's an archive webcast as well, um, so you can uh, go back and, and watch anything you want to see again. Um, a quick reminder, uh, we are going to have a moderated Q&A discussion in a, in a few minutes, um, actually like a few seconds at this point. Uh, and if you have any questions out there in our streaming audience, uh, you can ask those to us by, in two different ways. One is you can follow us on Twitter at EESI online and ask it that way, or you can send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. And uh, now it is time to hear from some other folks and to... Um, uh, move into a moderated discussion based on um, sort of all of the great information that Nate and Carla just presented. Um, now I get to introduce my colleague, Anna McGinn. Um, Anna uh, is a policy associate with ESI and um, uh, 
uh, it will be leading and most of the most of the question and answer period that we'll be getting to in a moment. Um, and we are going to be joined uh, in addition to uh, Nate and Carla. Uh, they will be sticking with us for the next while. We also have three other climate experts, uh, clean energy leaders, who will be joining us for that discussion. Um, so a little bit of a different format today, but um, this is a great topic and there's lots of different perspectives to share. So I'm going to introduce our three additional climate experts, and then I'm going to turn it over to Anna and them to um, move into that discussion. Uh, first is Elon Strait. Elon is the director of U.S. Climate Campaigns in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, he manages the We Are Still In initiative, uh, which launched to raise the voice of and promote the collaboration of subnational actors who support the Paris Agreement on climate change, to build a broader base of support for climate action in the United States, he develops and executes local and national climate campaigns. Uh, we also will be joined by Lisa Jacobson. She is the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Lisa has advised states and federal policymakers on energy, tax, air quality, and climate change issues. She is a member of the Department of Energy's State Energy Efficiency Steering Committee, the U.S. Trade Representatives Trade and Environment Policy Advisory Committee, and uh, the Gas Technology Institute's Public Interest Advisory Committee. Uh, Kelly Stone is our third uh, additional expert. She is a senior policy analyst at ActionAid. She focuses on biofuel, climate change, food security, and land use. She joined ActionAid in 2000, ActionAid to USA in 2014. And before that, she worked in the U.S. House of Representatives, specializing in food security, uh, as well as foreign affairs and appropriation. She has master's degrees uh, from the, or a master's degree from the London School of Economics and a bachelor's degree from DePaul University. Welcome, uh, Elon, Lisa, and Kelly, and Anna. Uh, three of you are in great hands. Anna is going to take very good care of us during the moderated Q&A, and I'm gonna be watching for audience questions. Welcome to the briefing today. Great, thanks so much, Dan. Um, and to all our panelists, we're so excited to have you, and Carla and Nate, thank you so much for that introductory presentation. We're excited to dig in a little more to the America's Pledge work, as well as the work of our other panelists. So. To start us off, um, to our panelists who didn't present, we're wondering if you can describe your organization's approach to inspiring, coordinating, or implementing climate actions in the U.S. leading up to 2020, which, as we all know, has been a key benchmark year for climate goals. So, Elon, maybe we'll start with you, um, and then we'll go to Lisa and then to Kelly. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. So. Uh, it is a great time to sort of sit back and reflect uh, on what we've learned over the last uh, four years. And, and that presentation by Nate and Carla was especially good at, at laying out what has been successful and uh, what's worked to, to drive, as Nate and Carla both alluded to, some pretty shocking results when you think about what you might have expected to happen on climate action uh, over, the last, over the last four years, and especially culminating in, in th this pandemic. Um, so. Uh, what I what I my work has really been around movement building, trying to trying to build a coalition of cities and states and businesses and universities and cultural institutions and faith groups and others who who want to remain committed to climate action and uh, but at the same but at the same time really in 2016 didn't know where to begin. So there I think a lot of institutions and a lot of leaders viewed this as an issue for the federal government that the federal government was going to handle uh, 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 w back in 2016. And then when President Trump announced that he was going to call the United States in the Paris Agreement, all of a sudden, all of these leaders sat down and thought for themselves, well, I guess I have to sort of pick up the, the, the mantle here and think about how I can drive this agenda forward. And in some sense, and I hate to even say this, but in some sense, that's a bit of a silver lining of that action, that the withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Agreement has forced a lot of these institutions to think and act uh, on their own on, on, on climate action so that exactly as Nate said, when the federal government gets back into re-engage, which, which hopefully they'll do in, in, uh, in a month, uh, that there is this huge foundation of, of subnational action around the country. But I wanna point to, to three lessons in particular. The first is that policy and political levers in the United States are, are everywhere you look really, that the way this country is set up, it is not a top-down economic system, the way that some other countries are. A lot of the choices about where emissions come from are made at a hyper-local level. 
So if you think about the uh, a reliance on natural gas to heat homes or, tra or where our transportation emissions come from, those are actually made sometimes at not even the city level, but the town level for, for building codes or for public transportation or uh, where roads are going to be put. And, and those decisions can be incentivized by the federal government. We can create standards at the federal level, but at the end of the day, those are always going to be local decisions. And so how we bring local decision makers into the climate policy process, it was important over the last few years, and it will continue to be important going forward. The second is a big lesson I learned was about the strength in numbers. In 2016, climate and, and views on climate were, were very political. It, it was seen as even a, a partisan thing, which it still is to some extent, but, but so much less so now. When we launched We Are Still In, it was a statement that um, uh, institutions did not support the president's decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And we had lots of institutions, corporates in particular, who were nervous about speaking out against a presidential decision. But once it reached a certain threshold, hundreds or thousands of institutions were saying the same thing. It was much easier for them to join that coalition and, and say, uh, say, their, uh, say their piece as well. So much so that uh, we're constantly looking for, in, in our parlance, unusual suspects, new speakers in the movement, uh, folks that, that might catch your eye uh, that they're speaking out about climate change. And it is getting harder to find unusual suspects. People like institutions like Walmart or McDonald's are now usual suspects in the climate movement. Uh, and, and that's a huge movement from 2016. And the last thing I'll say is just that there, one lesson learned, especially this year, was that there is no way to adequately address the climate crisis without a view of, of viewing this through the lens of environmental and racial justice. Um, uh, first of all, you, the, the moral cause that we're talking about here is that the people who have caused this crisis the least are the ones who bear the brunt the most. And in the United States, that is in particular communities of color, especially on the coasts. And uh, you, can, you can learn a lot about the politics of this issue just by learning about how climate, is, climate change is being caused and, how, and who climate change is being impacted. So for example, the best predictor of where a fossil fuel facility is located in the United States is the race of the neighboring communities. It's not their income level, it's not the education level, it's their race. And so that tells you things about uh, who is able to prevent the installation of fossil fuel facilities in their backyard and who isn't. And so when you're trying to build a movement of people who want to support cleaner air and cleaner water, it's really important to include the people who have those facilities in their backyard right now. And I don't think the environmental movement does that adequately yet. And it's something that we really need to build on in the future. Thanks so much, Elon. Um, Lisa, if you want to jump in, that'd be great. I would love to, and um, pleasure to be with you all. And Elon, you said so much in there that I really appreciate and agree with, given my vantage point. And I'm speaking today representing members of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. We are a broad-based energy trade association focused on clean energy technologies, products, and services. And we, we are mostly commercially available technologies, so things like energy efficiency, uh, natural gas technologies, renewable energy, energy storage, sustainable transportation, and you know, digital technologies that help integrate it all. So, you know, we are a movement ourselves, a coalition of industries that both uh, support um, and implement their own uh, climate change strategies. So I can talk about that from a subnational perspective, but also they're helping their customers and clients achieve their economic and sustainability goals. And it really has never been a better time to be investing and working in the energy sector. You know, I've been involved on the policy side for almost 20 years now, and the growth um, and maturity and the advancements made in the sectors that I've been working with is really phenomenal. Um, so one of the things that BCSE does is it tries to share and document those changes. And just like we heard with what America's Pledge is documenting, um, really dramatic and important uh, advancements. And I can talk about some of them in other parts of the Q&A, but also just to point out that even though there have been significant um, economic and job implications, given the business conditions of COVID-19, we've not seen uh, our companies tell us that their customers or clients are backing away from these important climate change and sustainability objectives. And 
it's also accelerated a conversation on making sure that their facilities and their whole business is more resilient. And that is something that the federal government has a role to play in and helping those companies and industries become more resilient, but also it can be a real leader and um, demonstrator of how you integrate both mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and investment in resilient, resilient infrastructure into uh, the work and, and the models that they are achieving. So you know, I also wanted to say just about subnational action overall, that was a, a really big focus in the lead up to Paris because as international governments and stakeholders were thinking about the science and, and noticing that we were still very far behind even our short-term emission reduction goals, we understood that the private sector and other subnational actors were gonna be essential um, to move us forward. So there was a great deal of time and energy spent trying to build coalitions to bring subnational actors more into the conversations on policy, but also more into the investment and implementation. And that was going fairly well. Uh, there was a lot of activity in the lead up to Paris, but as was just, just discussed by Elon, if there is a silver lining, at least from a US perspective of the US uh, pulling out of Paris, it was the reaction by the private sector. And that's one of the things that Business Council for Sustainable Energy has been tracking extremely closely. And when I look, for example, at just one of the metrics in terms of corporate action to reduce emissions, let's look at procurement of clean energy. You know, when we ended uh, the decade, we went from basically no corporate procurements in clean energy to, you know, about 14 gigawatts of signed power purchase agreements for renewable energy, you know, just dramatic, dramatic changes. And we were doubling upon doubling each year. So with the COVID pandemic this year, we were concerned that we wouldn't see the level of activity in corporate PPA signings and corporate interest in activity in renewable energy. The interest might be there, but for, for other reasons, it might have been stalled. Well, we don't have the final data yet for 2020, but what we are understanding is that it's still quite robust. And again, uh, there's not a move away from using more clean and renewable energy. So just to kind of close out as Elon did with a couple of points that maybe we can get into, um, when we think about climate action in 2020 and what we need to do going forward, we need to think about leveraging the private sector. So it really is a public-private partnership. And there certainly are things that the federal government has done and can do to accelerate that type of activity. Also, we are in a totally different landscape when it comes to opportunity and affordability of clean energy than we were even, let's just say, five to 10 years ago. Um, and the private sector is proving that. Um, because we are now, as Elon said, able to point to many different types of companies and not just uh, kind of the big names that were kind of the high profile early movers, it's really embedded in all sectors of the economy. You know, we are able to show that clean energy is practical, it is reliable, it is affordable, and it has very strong economic benefits. So those are the kinds of things that I reflect on, um, even with the challenges we have with the COVID economic uh, situation and what we need to do for recovery. Clean energy stands out. It can help us solve the problems that we have, both from a sustainability perspective and also in terms of having a robust economy going forward. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Kelly, love to give the stage over to you for your uh, response to the question. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so as I'm Kelly Stone with ActionAid USA, and uh, ActionAid is an international network uh, that works on issues of extreme poverty and working with local communities on really realizing their human rights. And my office in the US focuses particularly on climate change and food rights. So for us, actually, this conversation really starts with the climate crisis and where we need to get to, uh, to have a chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the IPCC says that the next decade is really critical to realizing that goal um, and that to have a chance, we really need to be cutting emissions globally 
reduced uh, by 50% by 2030. Um, so we start at that international level, but then of course what the IPCC report doesn't say is how you split that effort between all the many stakeholders uh, that, have, uh, that have a role to play here. So we have been working with colleagues at the UNFCCC to really develop what we call a fair shares approach. And we think this approach is really key to unlocking ambition at the international level between countries. Uh, so for this, the, you know, the question is, how do we divide it up fairly? And uh, we start with the principles that, you know, it should be based on historical responsibility. How much of the mess has each country made? But then also capacity. What capacity do they really have to act on climate change? Um, and what we found was that uh, international cooperation here is really key. If you take all the rich countries who have had a huge role in creating this crisis, that even if they did everything, that would actually not be enough to solve the problem. That does not get us to the global level of effort that's needed. Um, and so we is really required for rich countries to do their fair share. They need to be doing everything they can domestically but then also working um, to provide support to poor countries to expand their capacity so that they can be doing more um, to act on climate than would be reasonably fair or practical to be asking them to do so. So with that sort of framework, we've been having a conversation in the US Climate Action Network for the past year and a half about what is the US fair share and how do we take that approach into the next decade and really work towards what needs to happen? Um, and through that process of looking at what the U.S. historical responsibility is, which is, of course, huge, we're still the largest historical emitter, um, and what our capacity is, which is significant, even considering the huge um, and, uh, and unacceptable inequality in this country. Um, and we've come up with the figure uh, that is 195% emission reductions from our 2005 baseline by 2030. Now that's a big number. Um, and based on what US CAN is calling for in other spaces, we're looking at um, what we see as necessary would be 70% emissions reduction from that 2005 baseline by 2030. And then that 125% to get to that uh, 195 would then be through international support. So that's climate finance, capacity building, technology transfer, all the different other types of avenues that we uh, have available to us to help promote action in other countries who wouldn't otherwise have the capacity to act on this and who are frankly already getting hit very hard by the climate crisis. Um, and my organization really sees this as a moral imperative. Like I said, we're a human rights-based organization, so that's definitely where we start. But we also see this as a political and pragmatic necessity. The U.S. fair share is so big, no one else is going to come in to clean up our mess. Like, there is no one out there who could possibly fill the hole left by U.S. inaction. If we're going to reach the 1.5 degree goals in the Paris Agreement, the U.S. has to do its part. But we also see it as a pragmatic point for if we we need we really need everyone to be doing their part if we're going to be meet, meeting the uh, Paris Agreement goals, and that means that you know having everyone do their part and having it seen as fair is really going to be essential to unlocking that ambition. It just wouldn't be fair to ask other countries to do their part if we aren't doing ours. So we really see this fair shares approach as the way to unlock that needed ambition from all the parties involved so that we can collectively at the international level, the national level and the local level really get to the climate action that we need. I will leave it there and I look forward to everyone's questions. Thanks so much, Kelly. And I wanna pick up on the fair share analysis from US Climate Action Network, because I think it's a, a great place to look at what the US really needs to be looking towards as our um, responsibility for addressing climate change. And so we've heard from Carla and Nate, um, as well as Lisa and Elon about so much of what's going on in the US already. And so I wanna look, take the conversation a little bit forward looking and see how we can build upon the non-federal and federal climate work that's happening um, to, to see how we could get towards 
the goal that um, is in the fair share analysis. So um, maybe we'll go to Carla and then Nate to kind of reflect on what might be the opportunities based on the analysis that you've both done with America's Pledge to see what could be some really groundbreaking next steps the U.S. could take if we had um, all actors on board. Thanks for that question. Um, so I think that I think the key element you both said there is all actors on board. So our analysis from America's Pledge looks at what's possible in the U.S. if these cities, states, businesses, and others continue their amazing momentum, and if the federal government in 2021 reengages in a serious way. So a lot is possible, and. The, there's different authorities across those levels. So if you look at the local level, there's building codes. At the state level, they can pass renewable portfolio standards. At the federal level, there's regulations that can be put in place. So all of those different level, levels of government combined with the private sector actors that Lisa talked about can really make significant progress in the US. But we find that it, it's gonna take all of them working together uh, not just one set of them moving forward. And I'll say quite practically in the data, we've seen a lot of the early actions focused on clean electricity. And you see in the actual emissions data from the United States that our electricity emissions are going down quite significantly. And over the past year or two, there's been a significant focus on clean transportation and on efficient and electric buildings. So I think we're at the point where we're going to start to see those reductions in the emissions data for the U.S. And of course, we have an emerging conversation around all the different parts of industry. How do we beef up American manufacturing and at the same time significantly reduce emissions and improve quality of life? And those emerging conversations, I think, will, will start to drive the emissions reductions that we're gonna see in a couple of years. So we've seen electricity emissions coming down. We've seen building and transportation emissions and actions starting to be at the point where they're gonna be coming down. And then I think industry will follow. So some, some real opportunity there. Yeah, and so yeah, thanks for that question. And, and also thanks to all the the panelists for those great comments um it, it's just uh extraordinary hearing all the uh, all these different views and and uh certainly exciting to hear all the the work that's been going on across the community um so so just to the question carla hit the main points i think that that are important um i i would sort of um you know add that so so carl carla made a couple of points about specific sectors and about the all-in sort of strategy those are critical. Um, the other way to think about it is, you know, to think about what are the sectors, you know, how, how do you kind of get to net zero? That's like another kind of organizing principle that I think we, um, even uh, e even through the incoming administration, has articulated a, a net zero concept. And, um, you know, ultimately, there's only a few big pieces, to, there's a few big sort of categories of action, right? You, you know, you decarbonize your electricity, get all the carbon out of it, you use that electricity wherever you can to, to you know, provide energy services. Uh, and then you um, you use that electricity more efficiently. And then you work on non-CO2, you know, kind of other gases, right? Like there's kind of a few ways to cut that, but basically that's that's it. And, and I think that we have to think about all those different things all at one time. And, and it turns out that some of those things are gonna be easier for certain kinds of actors to grab hold of and, and deal with. Uh, let's have those actors do that. And I think that's what we've been seeing over the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, I want to also not just an important, uh, and if, if anything, we've seen an acceleration. But um, but ultimately, uh, I think as Carla said, the, the very kind of, in terms of scaling in the US, like the very big opportunities are in the electricity sector in the immediate term. There's a lot of very cheap opportunities there. Uh, use less coal. Is, is is probably the, the key one uh, but there's lots of other uh you know strategies to, to deal with that um efficiency i think carla mentioned this too efficiency in in lots of different dimensions is a, is a really critical near-term option and then also you know in, in terms of thinking about other kinds of groups and constituencies you know land sector work is actually going to be ultimately very important 
Uh, I think there's a lot of different kinds of actors and actions that can be done in lands that are going to be also critical, both in the near term, but also setting us up in the right way for like delivering post 2030. And I think there's like thinking about those kinds of strategies can also be something that our uh, various groups uh, focus on. Thanks, Nate. Uh, Elon or Kelly or Lisa, feel free to jump in if you have additional comments there on how we can um, look towards addressing this gap between um, where US can is laying out that we need to be and where we currently are. This is Lisa. I'm happy to hop in and then just following up on Carla's comments. Yes, when we look at things like, you know, U.S. emissions and she mentioned the power sector at the end of the last decade, we were 25 um, percent uh, reduction in power sector emissions over the last decade. So that was really remarkable. But certain areas like transportation, industrial, commercial, we clearly need more work. And when you think about the experience we've had with the COVID pandemic, we clearly have seen transportation related emissions go down. So I'm very curious to see what our new baseline is gonna be when we start the year. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity for uh, fuel economy improvements and uh, fuel efficiency improvements. So um, that, gives me, that gives me hope. But I actually wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the comments that were made about the international. And one of the things that I really valued when I first got involved in this field was the international development aspects of capacity building in the areas of climate mitigation and adaptation. And the Business Council for Sustainable Energy was very involved with that, um, both with our federal government through the US Agency for International Development, the Department of Energy, uh, some of our national labs, and you know, even though our industries were maturing and evolving and innovating, we were sharing that expertise with other countries. And some of that was very local, on the ground um, with partner countries. So we've lost a good amount of that in terms of the investment that the federal government makes in programs like that. Um, and we've also lost you know, kind of the broader diplomatic advantages that come from working on the ground with those countries. And then from a business perspective, you know, we are leaders in clean energy technologies in terms of um, manufacturing them uh, and then implementing them in countries. But without the partnership of the federal government to help us, you know, we sometimes are inhibited from, from offering those products and services to customers and clients in other countries that might need it. So from, from my standpoint, and certainly BCSE will be sharing this with the incoming Biden and Harris administration, we need to re, uh, retake that leadership role as it comes to helping with capacity building in other countries and sharing the knowledge um, and you know, the business products and services that US companies can help with. Yeah, and I can jump in on that because um, I do think climate finance is a huge part of what can make the international co cooperation work. Um, and it's, it's uh, when you think about like the U.S. contribution to the Green Climate Fund and the U.S. presence in you know, something like the Green Climate Fund, we've just been absent because that's something that the federal government really has to, has to play a primary role in. But I do see uh, an important need for, for state and local work sort of unlocking that ambition and pushing forward that federal government interest, because I think it's gonna be really essential that the US come back into climate finance in a big way. Um, and, and making people understand that, you know, this isn't charity, actually, this is part of doing our fair share of cleaning up the mess that we had a huge role in creating. Um, and that people are really suffering right now through no fault of their own with the climate crisis. Um, and I, I also want to pick up on um, something I think Nate mentioned on agriculture and land use. I think this is really key and somewhere where there's a lot of potential. Um, and it also speaks to what we've been talking about with how, you know, fortunately, it seems like we've been able to move forward on climate action through 2020 despite the crisis. But I think some of that is because a crisis like COVID, just like climate change, really shows the cracks in the current system. And it shows who's already hurting because they get hit twice as hard. And so I think we need to take 
what's been happening in the food uh, sector and the food supply chain challenges and the challenges in, in meatpacking plants um, and really take that as a point to look that, you know, this is something that's not working. Um, and how do we how do we build towards a, a better vision for agriculture that works for the workers, the farmers, you know, and the planet and the people who eat the food too? Yeah, I, I sorry from my point of view, I would just uh, I really liked what Carla was saying about the need to cooperate and how cooperation across different communities can can create. Uh, sort of exponential action. And I think what's going to happen, what you're going to see over the coming decade, or at least I hope what's going to happen, is that these transitions are going to seem slow and then all of a sudden. And they're going to happen very rapidly. And my concern uh, is equally, how do we make sure that these economic transformations happen, but also how do we make sure that nobody gets left behind by these transitions? That means uh, people that uh, that currently are looking for employment, how do they find employment in a new economy? And second, people that are currently employed either directly or tangentially in the fossil fuel industry, how do we make sure that that we're not decimating communities as a result of this transformation the way that we saw in, in the 90s with, with trade opening up around the world? And so those are two things that I think are, are absolutely essential to uh, uh, solving the politics of this issue as well. Because I do really think, as Carla was saying, that once these communities start cooperating with each other, once the incentives are aligned in the right direction, these transitions can happen quite rapidly. Thank you, Long. Um, and so as we, so we just looked ahead a little bit and now I wanna take us uh, looking back again to see how we might um, inspire some of this all in and federal action that's really needed. So I'm wondering if you could share an example of a scalable climate action that's currently underway in a part of the US or in a company um, that you think that Congress can learn from in terms of designing federal policies that might be introduced to the next Congress um, that would really bolster climate action at the federal level. And to the extent we can um, build in how they address kind of systems thinking of incorporating environmental justice and incorporating public health and these other really key lenses that we have to look at everything through. Um, we'd love your comments on those as well. Um, so Carla is nodding her head. So maybe we'll start with you, Carla, and then we'll uh, go around again. Right, thanks so much. And I, I love your focus on the tangible examples because um, when we're talking about climate across all sectors and across the world, it, it can be a lot. So just focusing in, one that's been really interesting for me is building electrification. So what I mean by that is making sure that our HVAC systems for, for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning and our appliances in buildings are electric. And what that can do is significantly improve indoor air quality. And one stat that surprised me is that if you have a natural gas stove and you don't have the vent hood on, then 60% of the time, the NOx emissions inside are higher than outdoor ambient air quality standards. And that can have serious impacts for anyone with any kind of health condition, particularly for young or elderly. And right now during COVID, we've seen the clear data that air quality can exacerbate COVID symptoms. So in that shift to building electrification, there's a wealth of existing electric technologies available. For example, across the Southeast, most heating and air conditioning is electric. Heat pumps are a, a very efficient way to do that. Of course, we have options for electric appliances, and we've been electrifying uh, the rural United States um, through the rural electrification programs for 100 years with huge benefits for farmers and all kinds of folks. So there has been a wave of cities, uh, particularly led in California and Massachusetts, but also across the entire U.S., who have taken the steps to either pass or start considering passing rules that all new construction would be all electric. Because when, when you're starting from scratch, it's easy to go all electric. And then there's options for, you know, as appliances hit their end of life, you're switching from gas to electric. One interesting thing that we'll have to look at there is a lot of energy efficiency incentives offered by utilities, offered by third-party providers 
are designed to help us reduce our electricity use. And in this, in this electrification world, we're looking at actually increasing our electricity use in, in a way, of course, that's very efficient. Uh, but we will have to look at re refining some of those incentives at, at the local and federal level, which is a very interesting trend with clear on the ground health opportunities as well as climate benefits. Great, I love that example. Um, Lisa, can we jump to you next? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually was going to focus on some of the changes in building efficiency, but from a different direction, just moving towards a kind of systems building energy management. And then as I was talking before about digital technologies, how digital technologies can help accelerate a range of benefits, including energy efficiency. Um, you know, and also, you know, just kind of piggybacking on what was just discussed, there are other areas of innovation that I think are really exciting in, in building, uh, you know, in the building sector. And some of those relate to fuels. And so what I've noticed in the last several years with a number of our members, because I represent natural gas interests, is a focus on procuring renewable natural gas or helping their customers procure renewable natural gas. And at the end of last year, I believe there was five states um, that had voluntary tariffs to allow renewable natural gas uh, to be offered to customers. And I think nine states were, were looking at it. So it's still small, but important. And I agree, you know, we need to look at reducing emissions in all areas. So, you know, building efficiency and a systems approach to building energy management combined with digital tools and new and innovative fuels and resources are going to enable the building sector uh, to go much farther than it has in terms of reducing emissions. And it's very exciting. So thank you. Great. Elon, I know uh, as the director of We Are Still In, you probably have about a thousand or more examples uh, <laughs> running around your head at any given time. Uh, but we'll give you the opportunity to pick one or two to share with us. Um, I'll, I'll pick one that, that I think is more of a national policy issue because uh, that's who we're speaking to today. So the one, and, and people talk about this all the time, so nothing I'm going to say is, is that uh, ingenious, but it, it's, it's our grid, it's the national grid. And, and the fact that uh, having multiple grids that, that could be more resilient to shock, uh, that, that could be more modern, uh, presents security risks for, for the United States, both in terms of, of cybersecurity and other and other issues. I, I think that the the one thing that, that we should tackle, or, or not the one thing, but one of the major things we need to tackle, uh, if we're going to spend money on infrastructure, is how do we modernize, how do we modernize the grid? And, and how do we make it a grid that's more able to take on and offload uh, renewable energy on, on the cycles uh, that renewable energy is on, and is, and is better able to take use of, of all the storage uh, innovation that's been going on over the last few years. So, I think I think that is a, a real barrier for a lot of the local work that that uh, we've been working on is is the, the weak or, or features of of our national grid system, which um, which I think now twenty twenty one is a is a real opportunity to think about how we how we just um, get a national grid that is that is capable of transitioning to completely clean energy, so that we can have the air quality as Carla was talking about that that people desperately want. I can jump in on that. Yeah, um, I think I think from an international perspective, I mean, one from the for for Congress is start appropriating climate finance money again. Authorizing and appropriating money to the Green Climate Fund is a big step, um, and part of that is also thinking through. You know, when we think through all of our foreign policy and all of our our diplomacy, we should be applying a climate lens to that, just like we should be applying a climate lens to all the domestic legislation that um, may be moving forward. Um, I also think in the US, actually, something to think about is uh, land access for small farmers. We're losing a lot of small family farmers right now in the economic crisis. And so finding ways to keep them on the land and to get new farmers who are interested in farming in a, in a way that is um, going to help us instead of hurting us on the fight against climate change is a really key program to be pushing forward. Sorry, I cheated and slipped into. That's all right. <laughs> Nate, over to you. So sure, these are all great. And I, you know, just to 
so you know, quick uh, other thought on this is first of all, um, I'll say you know y yes on the the the, uh, the thinking about climate finance. I mean, I think one of the ways that you know we in the U.S. will ultimately you know s succeed is not only by getting our own house in order, which is a lot of the focus of today's conversation, but I think. Um, you know, using, you know, doing what we ought to be doing, which I think, uh, you know, we've heard a little bit about in the, in the, in the interventions today. Uh, and I think that's really important to keep a focus on, but then also thinking about how, you know, we, we can, you know, get others to do more. And, and I think just making sure that we are, we are doing the right thing in the international scene is also really going to be critical for that raising of global ambition that we know we need to do. Uh, globally to, to get onto a 1.5 path. So just a kind of yes on that. Um, and then one other quick thing, I mean, I think Carla or maybe somebody else mentioned methane. You know, there, there's, a, there's a whole other, I was talking about the lands and different constituents. I also think that there's, there is some near-term opportunity in just methane leak reduction. And that's on both the, the you know, whether you like or don't like fracking, um, you know, there's, it's gonna be around a little longer. And uh, you know, figuring out how to clean that stuff up in the near term is actually kind of helpful, and could could in fact help you know kind of reduce emissions you know relatively quickly. It's not necessarily the path we want to be on the long term, but there are opportunities there that bring in different kinds of organizations and interests that could be valuable. And then the other side of that, of course, is cleaning up leakage in in current distribution uh, infrastructure, like in Boston or whatever. And there's lots of partnerships that have been uh, you know kind of built out uh, with uh, private sector and public sector uh, actors um, that have been quite successful, very low cost, high emissions reductions. And, and, and there, you know, there's a, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a smaller, you know, uh, area, but it's one that there could be a, a good amount of near term collaboration, I think. So that's just another one that I think people might be, you know, kind of look at uh, as, as a possibility. Great. I, I hope that congressional staffers and all of our audience are taking notes. I feel like we've got a great compilation of ideas here to build upon. Um, and I know that we had a question in from the audience. So I'm going to uh, send it over to Dan to share that. Right. Yes. Um, and yeah, there's so much good stuff. It's been such an interesting conversation to listen to. <clears throat> this is a question that I think actually is a kind of an interesting follow up to the question that Anna just asked you all. Um, but before I ask it, um, there was uh, there has been so much more discussion of building codes today than I expected. My favorite issue, um, and I actually just wrote an article about the latest uh, building energy code development cycle, and unfortunately, some really critical electrification code proposals that got adopted got left out when it was finalized. And so, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, um, I just wrote an article about it that was in yesterday's Climate Change Solutions. Um, but back to the question. Um, this one's about examples of creative solutions, um, especially those that might come from sector to sector competition or competition between levels of government that either encourage agility or nimble responses to climate change or that maybe encourage new um, partnership building. Um, so you just, everyone just had a great example of a scalable um opportunity for um emissions reductions are there any that are have been that you've come across that are especially creative from a partnership building or from a um you know just just which is more innovative um not sure who wants to go first on that i'm trying to read your expressions uh to figure <laughs> out who has the right thing to say it's always tricky but it looks like carla carla's <laughs> raised her hand. right um, I love this question. So what, one of the areas that's been really fascinating to me has been in the We Are Still In Coalition, there's cultural institutions like museums, and there's universities and colleges. And they have the, the really unique dual challenge of their educational institutions, so that they're teaching us about these issues. And then they can also walk the walk themselves by you know, implementing efficiency in museums, you know, having electric vehicle charging, having solar. Universities are doing all kinds of things. So they're both educating and doing. And then what's been interesting to watch is as these different sectors come together, they're also leaders across their communities. So teaming up with cities, teaming up with state officials, teaming up with corporates. So what we find is this 
the the organization structure for these different sectors to be able to talk to each other actually has cultivated quite a bit of creativity and bringing, as Alan was saying, unusual suspects to come together and, and make changes and also create that, that base of community that's really important to keep this movement sustained over time. Wait, I want to come in on this because it's, it's so funny because Carla is talking about a We Are Still an example, and I was actually going to talk about an America's Pledge example <laughs> of, of uh, an innovative thing. And, and what I've been really excited about is as the America's Pledge analysis has uh, matured, it's gone from a, a, a pretty high level analysis of what's possible with subnational action to getting really detailed about uh, what are the specific opportunities, as you guys saw in the in the presentation. But what else is possible? And, and uh, I hope I'm not betraying any confidence by saying that Carla is working on this, in fact, is that uh, you can then do that at a state level. So you can then within a state say, uh, here are the emissions reductions potential uh, in this state. Here are the best opportunities. And then you can get even more specific. And you can say things like what you need to do in the state of X, like let's just take like, the state of Massachusetts, it is we need to get to electric vehicle penetration of 70% by, by 2030. What that means is we don't have enough charging uh, stations right now for that. We actually need seven times more charging stations. And then that gives you like a pretty clear roadmap for the state of Massachusetts about how you uh, get on the pathway towards transformation. It, it gets you out of the, the mindset of, well, we just need to spend more money on this or we need to change consumer behavior to really tangible steps that the analysis can show you of, we need a sevenfold increase in the EV charging institutions charging uh, stations, which means we need uh, 10 more institutions to volunteer to put charging stations in their parking lots, et cetera. Like you can get really detailed. And so that's been one of the most exciting things for me is watching as this analysis, which used to be a very high level of like, what's the US emissions inventory? What's the projection to now having these bottom up estimates that can really create action plans just on their own uh, in a particular place that I've, I've loved to see, I've loved seeing that. Kelly, do you want to jump in next? Sure. Um, and, and I'll actually build on that a little bit and say that, I mean, so my organization's approach to development is that, you know, it really should be community led and that the community knows what they need to realize their rights and um, to, to thrive. And so it's about um, uh, supporting them, you know, in their, uh, and how they want to get it. And so I think part of a just transition really for getting these nimble responses and these creative solutions, it, it is about taking that sort of community-based model and building a real picture like Elon was just talking about is that, you know, as a community, right down to the neighborhood and local level in the U.S. and in Bangladesh, you know, what kind of world are we building? And that gives people a stake in and they can see themselves in what is trying to, you know, what we're trying to build too. And that makes it easier to, and possible to really unlock the level of ambition and the, the creative unexpected solutions that we needed, that we need um, in a way that's actionable. Great, I'm glad you brought that up. That's something that we think a lot about, not just on the mitigation side, but on the adaptation side as well. Community involvement from the start is so critical. Um, Nate or Lisa, um, happy to give you an opportunity to hop on on this question, and um, and after that, we'll turn it back over to Anna to keep with our Q and A. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I think I had to. First of all, you, can you hear me? I don't know if you noticed, but I have a different background. Let's see who's paying attention. <laughs> I had a um, a power issue here in the office, so I had to switch to another location. So I wasn't sure if you could hear me, but um, you know, a couple of things that I was going to point out. Um, one, which may not be new, but I think we're seeing it in new ways, and it certainly was covered in the other presentations, is the value of target setting. Um, especially now, you know, if, if you had had this panel a year ago, we probably would have been talking largely about science-based targets and how corporations in particular, but not only all institutions, as they were thinking about greenhouse gas management, we're moving towards science-based targets. And then in the last year, obviously there's been many commitments that are even more aggressive than what those science-based targets would have been one or two years ago. So it's really dramatic and important. 
And when I think about some of the commitments that have been made, especially for you know the 80% or above 2050 targets, in a lot of cases, those entities making those commitments don't necessarily know all the answers and how they're gonna get to those final stages of achieving their goals. But they've made those targets nonetheless because they're confident that they will be able to figure it out. And I think that is just extremely powerful. And when we think about what we would hope that the incoming Biden and Harris administration would do, it would be re to refresh a lot of the targets and goal setting processes that were put in place in previous administrations, both for uh, energy efficiency and energy management, for sustainability broadly, for resilience and adaptation, and of course, for greenhouse gas reduction. And by doing so and going down that path, they will not only improve federal facilities, but they will kickstart actions in at other levels, at community levels, um, certainly at state and regional levels, and within the private sector. And then the other comment I was gonna make, which also isn't necessarily a new comment, it's about public-private partnerships and really the power and innovation that comes with those kinds of conversations. And as was just said, BCSE has worked on those most recently in relationship to resilience planning in local communities that were impacted by hurricanes in 2017. So uh, Puerto Rico um, and Houston area, area uh, communities that were impacted in those storms. And we've been bringing companies in to talk with community leaders and citizens and policymakers to discuss what's needed at this moment in time to help them recover. And the new ideas and the innovative and, and really bold thinking that's come out of those conversations is quite powerful and has been very impressive to me. I did notice your background, Lisa, and thank you for being so resilient. <laughs> um, uh, Nate, happy to give you the, the final word and, and then we'll turn it back over to Anna. Okay, maybe just a short note, because there's been lots of other great uh, you know, contributions on this topic. I'm gonna just pick up on this last point about the target setting. Um, I think that's a really um, interesting dimension of how action can happen. And I think a, several of the other comments touched on this or, or kind of went into it in some detail. And so, you know, even as, as the, the entire country, you know, we, we undertake and we will undertake, I, I expect, a process of target setting over the next year or even less uh, to, you know, de develop a national climate strategy, deliver an NDC to the international community to catalyze action and also help give us a kind of, you know, North Star, something we want to we, we want to aim toward. Um, and, and that process, um, I think, is is the, the the way in which those processes are undertaken is evolving. But I also think that, you know, not only can we learn how to do that process better and more robustly at the national federal level uh, under this next uh, administration, and I think there might be, you know, ways that w experience of the last few years can certainly feed into that, that process, um, but also thinking about how that, that process of getting a group of actors together, you know, whether it's leaders or, or you know, legislatures or, you know, kind of coalitions, and thinking through what those groups want to do and how they can deliver them because there's this learning process that's embedded in that i think we just heard in the last comment how the you can get innovation you can get ideas you can get sort of creativity when you convene those kinds of conversations of okay what can we do what can we aim for and people learn about what the opportunities then are and that echoes back a little bit to ilan's point about how we've learned you know with this america's pledge we are still in you know broader subnational community about moving from the kind of big picture aggregation questions to kind of going down to the the kind of dimensions of what different groups can do in their own specific jurisdictions or or organizational kind of infrastructure and that's where learning happens and that's where actually you know some of the much of the value of this process can be uh, new value can be identified right so so i think thinking creatively again about how we use this kind of iteration process of thinking about what can we There's those opportunities diverse and, and often lower cost than many people have in their prior assumptions. They learn about that as they go through the process, they get excited about it, and then they want to do more. And obviously that aggregates to being able to do more as a country and as a world. Thanks, Nate. Um, so we've spent most of our conversation today, this afternoon, talking about 
um, mitigation strategies, how we're going to reduce emissions, decarbonize the U.S. economy. And I want to take a moment to think about the adaptation resilience side of things, the environmental justice side of things, and how um, looking forward that can also be integrated um, to the central piece of the work that it that it really is and in, in addressing climate change in a holistic way. So I'm wondering if each of you could speak a little bit to how in your ideal world, um, how the federal government would integrate the pieces of um, climate justice, climate mitigation, climate adaptation together as they look to put together a national strategy, as Nate just mentioned. And uh, that massive question can um, <laughs> that could be answered in the you know, next four minutes. That would be perfect. <laughs> so um, maybe Elon, we'll start with you and then um, we'll go around. Yeah, um, it, it's such a good question. I, 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 I've been wondering myself, like, over the last four years, as Nate was just describing, there's been these wonderful conversations that have been started in local communities as a result of either civil society or private sector uh, invitation and how much of that the federal government should should take over versus how much of that should continue to exist sort of in civil society. And I, I guess my, my response is, I think that the best, and, and um, Kelly said this earlier, but the, the best conversations, the best processes for determining uh, how to become more resilient, how to reduce emissions, how to become uh, uh, less polluting our community led our community led conversations. I think the best thing that the federal government can do is just to provide resources to communities around the country uh, to, to be able to manage those conversations and then the financial tools to invest in the infrastructure that's needed uh, to get that done. I, I would like to see the federal government ha have have the position of of letting a thousand flowers bloom, so to speak, in, in this context of how do we help Baton Rouge, Louisiana, have a conversation that makes sense for Baton Rouge, Louisiana about its resilience needs and its mitigation needs. And then when that when they've determined that this is the infrastructure that they need in order to survive uh, instead of a hundred year flood, a 500 year flood in, in the city because of climate change, how do we help them finance that infrastructure through loan guarantees or through municipal bond guarantees or something? I, in, in other words, the right approach here is one that, in my view, is as decentralized as possible, but as supported by by financial res by federal resources as much as possible. Great, that's really helpful. Please, please Carla, oh. and then we'll go to you, Lisa. Okay. Just to briefly add to that, I would say there's a, a huge opportunity here with stimulus because a lot of these communities are really hurting right now in keeping their existing infrastructure and, and clean energy efforts up and underway. So there's, a, there's an opportunity to help keep them afloat with that, with that stimulus, with, with funds going directly to them. And, and then I wanted to note that, that members of these coalitions are in basically every uh, congressional district. So uh, for those of you, you know, listening who are, are in staff offices or committee offices, I, I would really encourage you, if you haven't heard from these folks already, um, to engage with them directly because they, they have a lot to say and a lot of opportunity in, in the vision there for the future of their communities. Lisa, over so, to you. Sure. Yeah, I was just going to add to, to, I agree with Carla, and I appreciate what Elon said too. And from the experience that BCSE has had with this resilience planning project, you know, it won't surprise anyone that these communities um, all want to engage and want to bring in uh, their different constituents to the conversation, but they lack the resources. Many of them are just trying to, especially in the COVID pandemic times, but, but even before, just trying to um, maintain current operations. So I think uh, federal resources to help states, localities, and tribes do resilience planning um, with a holistic set of objectives in mind is extremely helpful. So I was going to say, you know, just big picture, what can the federal government do? It can support convening on a consistent um, and sustained basis, and it can provide capacity building resources to local governments and other organizers of these conversations. Nate, yeah, do you want to jump in? Or Kelly, go ahead. Sure. And then we'll give Nate no, Nate. 
you can go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. Well, anyway, I'll do. I'll keep mine really fast. Which is, which is, all these are are, are really great comments, and um, uh, I think mine's not that different. Which is, look, we've got you know, the climate crisis, the COVID crisis. We've got a a, a racial justice and equity crisis, uh, and 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 we've got an economic recession. And and I think that right now you know, addressing all of those, you know, we, we can do it, but we've got to kind of invest, right? Like it's got to be some significant, you know, sustained investment in sustainable infrastructure and making sure that that sustainable infrastructure is, as, as others have said very eloquently more than me, um, uh, kind of make sure that that is actually flowing to, you know, diverse places and, you know, different kinds of places in our country and not just for kind of energy technology and this or this or that, but it's actually integrated across all of these uh, considerations that I think we're talking about. I think we can get support for that. And I think that that's actually going to be a critical part of thinking about not just the next couple of years to 2030, but also putting us on the right pathway to the 2050 net zero. So we've got to do both of those things at the same time. And this is actually a really good moment to to start that that massive investment that I think we need to do. Yeah. And I'll just add to what everybody said. I do think a key part is keeping adaptation at the table with mitigation. It's both and. We can't ignore adaptation um, and assume that mitigation is going to solve the problem. It's already too late for that. Um, and I, I do think that keeping, I agree, keeping frontline communities at the center and core of all the planning um, and that also we need to be mindful, we need to be proactive about reaching out to marginalized and vulnerable communities and really putting them at the center. It's not enough to, you know, just to try to not be racist. You have to actually be anti-racist if you want to try to reach out to the folks that we need to get to. Um, and then the last piece I'd say is we, we really need to be acknowledging the harm that's already been done um, and recognizing that some of it can't be undone. We're already suffering loss and damage in this country um, and there needs to be work done on how to make people whole as much as we can. Great. Oh, go ahead, Anna. I was just gonna thank everyone um, for the great discussion, and then Dan has a couple um, wrap up points for us. Well, that's all I was going to say was thank you so much for an, an excellent panel, um, such an engaging and interesting conversation. Um, a couple of briefings ago, we um, some of our feedback uh, was that it would be helpful to have some some final thoughts at the end of the briefing rather than just just closing out. So um, I've been taking copious notes and just wanted to share a couple of thoughts as we wrap things up and. Um, part of the fun of organizing the briefings, it's our prerogative, we go a minute or two over. So um, first is, you know, something that really stuck out to me, the United States has an ability to do the right thing that goes far beyond the federal government. Um, leaders at the state and local levels have always, in fact, had a say in a wide range of environmental and clean energy issues, like building energy codes came up a few times today. And um, they've been more willing lately, maybe to step up after the federal government backed out of its uh, international commitments, and, and they've stepped up and they've mobilized and they've coordinated a pretty broad set of climate solutions. And to paraphrase Carla, all aboard, um, it's gonna take everything in order to, to make some progress and we've actually seen that happen. Um, I loved Elon's points about more and more usual suspects when it comes to climate action and fewer and fewer unusual suspects. And these suspects are also coming from more and more places, uh, including the private sector. And that presents an opportunity for innovation, for creativity, and for public-private partnerships. Um, we have to ensure that all of this work is done in a way that lifts up communities that are too frequently left out of environmental and energy, clean energy decision-making. Um, environmental justice and equity considerations, they're not actually considerations. They're central critical elements of the policy response uh, to climate change, as well as the other present crises um, that we're facing that Nate rattled off a few moments ago. Um, and then you know, I think last, you know, the next decade is really, really critical. And if you've watched our briefing today, um, you learned that there's a movement to build on and that there's a need for the federal government to reassert itself, including in international finance. And so as we close out 2020 um, and, and look to next year, after taking this moment to reflect, um, I hope you'll join us uh, in our audience. I hope you'll join us in our commitment to advancing Climate change solutions to realize our vision 
of a sustainable, resilient, and equitable world. Um, one last major thank you to our panelists today. Um, thanks for joining us. Someone who could not be with us today, but who deserves a special shout out is Brandon Wu. Um, Brandon is a colleague of Kelly's at ActionAid uh, and is a climate policy expert. And uh, he was a big part of the lead up to today. And I just wanted to acknowledge his help and also say hi in case he's still streaming us. Um, hopefully uh, he's having a good afternoon. Um, also like to thank everyone um, uh, on, on Team EESI who helps pull this off, not just Anna, um, but also Omri, our communications director, Dan O'Brien, uh, Sydney, uh, Amber, as well as our fabulous interns, Emma and Joseph, who are keeping up with highlights and also Twitter uh, today. So thanks to everybody. The slide that's up right now, just very briefly, if you have a moment, we'd love to have your feedback. Um, we, take, we pay very close attention to everything you tell us. If you have a moment to take the survey, it really does help us um, think about how to do these better, the topics that we need to address, and um, just in general, you know, continuous improvement, um, a good thing. If you have a moment, we really appreciate it. Last plug, uh, if you've missed anything today, if you want to go back and revisit anything, I hope you'll visit us online, www.esi.org, and um, you can uh, view our entire briefing archive, um, and I would be remiss to not once again mention our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's the best way to keep up. We've got a lot coming down the pike in 2021, and Climate Change Solutions will help you stay abreast of all of it. With that, um, thanks to our panelists today um, for helping us close out a really excellent um, uh, 2020 briefing series, Congressional Education Programming Series. Um, and uh, you've helped us, I think, take stock of where we are. And I think, for, for speaking for myself, I feel recharged uh, and can't wait for 21. 2021 to get here um, so that we can get to work um, with the new Congress and the new administration. So with that, we'll close. Thanks again. I hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon.